I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, this is William Jevnik. I have some updates. Uh, we've been off the air for about a month, and the reason for that is that I'm in the middle of moving from California to New Mexico. I'm actually in New Mexico, uh, but still in between the house sale in California and the new purchase here so most of my belongings are in pod storage units I got one of my computers out just yesterday so I could begin putting out some new content we won't be back up to our full recording of five or six shows a week for another month or so you know until I get settled into my new office but um, I'll do the best I can between now and then uh, in other news some have heard, but maybe most haven't on here. Our good friend and my co-host Tom passed away about a week ago from cancer. Uh, our hearts go out to his family and his wife. Uh, we will be bringing on some new people onto the panel, but uh, until that happens, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can with putting some recordings out. You will hear Tom occasionally on the Monday Review shows because those are older shows that we revisit because there's some interesting uh, content there. Today's show is going to be a tribute to Tom. Uh, I'm going to try to find his original uh, interview we did with him. But um, anyhow, I'm going to do the best I can with that. So hang in there, folks. We're going to get back up to recording. In a couple of months' time, I'm going to start putting video out. Uh, in this region, there's a lot of Bigfoot activity going on. I'm already getting stuff coming in from around the region here. I'm closer to Forest and TW now. So... I will be visiting them, and there is new activity at Forest House. So, again, you know, hang in there with us, folks. We're going to get back up to speed as soon as this move gets completed. And um, having said that, you know, enjoy today's show. Hello, everyone. I have a, a group discussion today. We're going to talk to Tom first about his experience with Sasquatches. And then Troy also had a really interesting encounter and brian is our screenwriter friend so fellows how are we doing this evening very good good very good okay tom let's go ahead and start with you just go ahead and dive into sure. you know in the beginning what happened and, and sort of take us through the events sure okay and this is actually uh this only happened mid-december last year oh so, so it's pretty recent yeah very recent and uh what started it was uh, just kind of a spur of the moment thing. I decided to go up, and you know, I live in Oregon, um, go up and get a, a Christmas tree uh, here. You know, so you just go to the Forest Service. It's five bucks. You get your permit, and you're good to go. And the the real nice trees for five bucks is uh, a noble fir. So I called a friend of mine and said, "Hey, come on, let's uh, let's head out of town and let's go, let's go get a tree." So he's he's up for that. And uh, now originally I was going to head up to uh, I don't know if, if if anybody's familiar with Oregon to from I live in the Mid Willamette Valley. Uh, Highway 126 goes east to to the Cascades and west to the coast. So I was going to go up 126, and he's like, "No, no, no I got a better place to go." And he used to work for the Forest Service. So I'm like, okay, well, let's let's see what you got in mind. So we went up to an area uh, totally different from where I wanted to go and stopped at the local uh, district ranger station there and, and talked to the uh, the botanists. And I was like, where do we, you know, where do I get the noble furs at? Because they had a huge one. They had like 18 footer in there. And uh, so she was very accommodating and said, you know, you want to be up to 4,000 foot elevation minimum. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm, sign me up. I, and that means we're going to get up into some really high elevation, uh, very rugged country up there. So, and it takes about an hour to get through the switchbacks and truth be known, it, it takes a little bit of time to uh, get unlost. <laughs> when you, yeah, 
I, I bought a map and and uh, you know we still managed to uh, get lost a couple times. You know, you get halfway up a road and you're like, nah, this isn't right. Mm -hmm. So we worked our way up to the top. And, you know, t to be honest, uh, really my focus was 100% on just getting a tree. And, and I was very fixated on that. So we get to the top of this summit, almost to the top. We're kind of stopped by a Forest Service gate. But uh, so we get out. And it is, I just got to tell you, the scenery was spectacular. It was really, really nice. And there's a big pile of giant rocks there. And I think this will come maybe, maybe play into the story later on. But I uh, saw a black marmot going down in there. So I assumed he's either getting away from us or, you know, maybe there's some rodents down there that he goes in there, gets some food. So, uh, my buddy's like, hey, you know what? I used to work up there. And so he goes, why don't you get the tree? And he's going to hike up to all the way to the summit, which is not quite maybe three quarters of a mile. So he's got to go up two or three switchbacks through the forest. Like, okay, cool. So he takes off and, and, uh, and I go scouting around and I finally find what I'm looking for and uh, cut down a tree and then like, ah. You know, <laughs> I had to cut it down about 150 yards from where my truck was. So great, I get to haul that thing back, and then you know get it in the truck. But it all worked out. And after a while, I see my buddy coming back down, and he's uh, he's like, ah, it's too far. You know, it was a long ways and uh, it was steep. And he's like, okay, great. So. Spent some time up there just uh, checking out the uh, the scenery, and the sun was starting to set off in the west. And you could get, uh, you know, what the Alpen glow is, or the or the mountains, or the snow capped peaks. It's turned this kind of a brilliant orange, and uh, and so that was that was happening out on the horizon there. So, as I'm leaving. Um, we're just in kind of a clearing area and then you just start to go into the forest and I notice a tree break. I'm like, man, I'm really tired. I just want to get home, but I really want to check it out because, um, you know, honestly, I read one of your books where you said you follow the tree break and right. maybe a hundred yards, you've got another one mm -hmm. and there could be a series of those. And I was very interested in that. But uh, so I've been trying to get my I've been trying to get back to that same location um, ever since. Go back, check it out. You know, see what's there. <clears throat> so and and anyway, so working my way down the down the mountain, and at that time, uh, I had some tires that were in a state of deferred maintenance. You know, bald. <laughs> <laughs> So, hey, I'm going to get every penny out of those things. They're expensive. It's a, it's a nice truck, and those are expensive tires. So, um, even with chains, it was it was really slippery when you're going downhill. So it took a while to work our way down. And by this time, it's pretty dark. Got to an area where we're pretty confident that we're below the snow line. So okay, cool. And get out of the truck, and then. I got one flashlight between the two of us to try to figure out how to get these. Is a brand new set of chains, new technology from one of the dealerships here. So you got to figure out how to get those chains out, get them unhooked, back the truck down a little bit, and then and then get the chains untangled and stowed. So I'm like, you know what? <clears throat> Run over to a tree and there's a nice stick there, and I just grab it and I go whack, whack on the side of the tree. <laughs> I just, I had to do it. I said, hey, told my friend, check this out. You know, famous last words, whack, whack. And, and I got to say that, you know, this guy is, he's adamant. There's no such thing as Sasquatch. He's not even a critic. That'd be a, that'd be a significant upgrade for him. They just don't exist. All right. And what happened is exactly what I thought would happen. Nothing. So I go back to stowing the chains, and he was uh, working with the chains at the, 
at the back of the truck. And about a minute, about two or three minutes later, it's dark, heard a loud whistle, one loud whistle. And, you know, the thing is, um, birds don't, it was like a human whistle, like somebody going, Mm -hmm. and it was loud, it's almost as loud as a car horn. And it came from about 20 or 30 yards away. And to be honest, at the time, I was tired. I was just really, really focused on getting the chain stowed, getting back down the mountain, not running, making sure we don't run into any more snow and, you know, have to chain up again. So I was preoccupied. He, on the other hand, goes, what was that? Loud. I mean, and the look on his face is what caught my attention because he was scared. And I'm like, this guy, you know, he's an outdoorsman too. I mean, he's, he's actually worked in this very area. And he may have phrased it a little differently <laughs> than just what was that. <laughs> and it was the look on his face that caught my attention. I was like, yeah, that, that was really odd because the area that we're in is – is uh, it's it's completely dead zone. It's very densely packed, Douglas fir, um, probably you know uh, plantation. You know trees that are planted by the Forest Service for harvesting later, and you don't really get any life at all until you get about 25, 30 feet up till you get to the canopy. So this is totally dead. The understory is dead. There's nothing in there, and then um, you know I sort of thought this through later on. You know, birds just don't, I've been around birds and animals my whole life. They simply, ex- birds especially, roosting birds, they don't respond with uh, human noise. Human activity doesn't cause them to make a whistle. And if they do, they usually have a song. You know, all birds have multiple notes in there. Mm-hmm. They just don't make one whistle. And this whistle was, and it's like, like I said, it's almost as loud as a car horn. Somebody very close, whistled loudly. And it really caught my friend's attention. And then I thought about it, yeah. So I got to thinking about it later. And I think I mentioned this when I contacted you was, oh, this is good. Um, It wasn't, the Sasquatch isn't whistling in response to us. He's not talking to us. Correct. Yeah. (laughs) He's probably communicating with others that are within hearing distance so i'm thinking oh great you know we got some unwanted company you know especially while you're underneath the truck you know horsing around trying to get those chains out of there um and so i really spent a long time just doing a process of elimination trying to think of anything that this could have been. And that's part of the reason, actually one of the main reasons I contacted you was, um, was, you know, I wanted somebody with experience to sort of analyze, uh, you know, my report, I guess, Mm -hmm. and, and just see if if it could be a Sasquatch or something else. I just can't think of anything else it would, that it would be. It really sounded like somebody whistled the woods was there any sign of any other people in the area zero none uh this is a complete this is an area that uh was in the wilderness designated to the willamette national forest it was a designated wilderness area and the location that we were at was uh it was a single road one road on the side of the mountain and so there's one way in one way out and that's this road There's nobody going up there and certainly nobody coming back. And if there had been, you know, you'd see them. There's no way Mm -hmm. you wouldn't. So unless they walk through, you know, 40 miles of national wilderness to get to that one spot. Well, you know, what's interesting is you hear a lot of people talk about vocals and things, but whistling is, with Indians especially, is the key element. You look at all their wood carvings. And whenever you see one and they talk about whether it's, you know, whatever name they're using, it has the pursed whistling lips. That's, that's one of the key elements among Indians about the Sasquatch. Uh, Brian, Brian, Toby, or Brian, Troy, you guys want to uh, 
jump in? So I take it next year, it might be better to get one of those fake trees from Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I wouldn't have a story to tell then. Well, and you also had a snap tree there. So, <laughs> again, that's kind of a sign of, you know, something in the area. What, what was the sign of this? Something in the area the, was? The, the snap tree. Yes. And yeah. That's, and that's not something people might think. I mean, especially if you're you've been in the outdoors a great deal, you're not going to mistake that very easily because you see a lot of weather breaks. And the kind that that I refer to, especially in my books, is very different. It's not it you can it's very obvious it's not done by weather or or something like that. Right. And I actually I should probably mention that. Uh let me go back to that for a second. Um because yeah, you, you can see snow breaks and weather breaks and just, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a deadfall. But this was one, and what struck me about it was in your book, you had mentioned where you found like a track of, I think, 11 of these things total. They're about seven to eight feet up, and it's snapped at, um, you know, like a 45 degree, no, not a 45, more like a 140 degree angle. It's pointing down to the ground. Right. And that's what caught my attention. And I almost stopped, but I was, you know, like I said, I just really wanted to get out of there. And I knew my friend would have um, less than 0% interest in, you know, investigating that. So, How thick was the tree where it was broken, do you think? Yeah, it was, uh, I would say, probably three inches. So it wasn't a huge tree, but... And that's very typical. See, that's what I find. You know, both in Skamania County, I found, you know, plenty of this up there, and, and it's way out in the middle of nowhere, uh, and also in California. Okay. That's, uh, it, it just looked, it looked odd. And, uh, you know, if you look at the area, so just, you know, from the standpoint of circumstantial evidence, um, I would think that the area would be very supportive of Sasquatch, because you have seasonal drainages you have mm-hmm. um actually you have more you have a lot of year-round drainages and my understanding correct me if i'm wrong but i think they like to uh, hang around areas that have water they need a water source right and yeah. so there's lakes like half a mile less than a half mile from there and, and the creek was probably 100 yards good sized creek Sure, and you get the food sources around those places, deer and other animals and, and the vegetation around water sources. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that was... Yeah, I, think uh, mean, I think, I mean, you talked, Will, about... Yeah, go ahead, Troy. Oh, no, I was going to say, I was <laughs> you know, dropping a bomb here a little bit, but didn't mean... You talk about uh, that's that's where they normally go to the bathroom too, in in the water. I, what was that? The in the water? I I didn't quite catch that. I said I think, that, I think me said and you talked like, before, and uh, that I'm sorry. Yeah, he's breaking in and out. He was saying, don't drink the water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For good reason. Well, <laughs> there's there's a lot of stuff with these guys around water. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and, of course, your, exactly. encounter, you... your encounter was right there at a creek. Yeah, you're talking about mine? Well, uh, Troy's. Yeah. Oh, Troy, Troy's. Okay. Troy's encounter was right at a creek. I, are you familiar with Troy's encounter? No, no, not at all. Oh, Troy, you might want to go ahead and uh, talk about that a bit. This is when I was in high school, so, you know, can you hear me any better, Will? Yeah, a little better. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. I, just, I was I was in, in high school my last year, school, about 98, 99, and uh, me and my buddy and my brother were fishing in a place called Little Clear Creek in, in West Virginia, and we'd been fishing all day and hadn't had much luck, so me and my buddy kind of gave it up, and we were horsing around in the water, and my little brother, he, he never gives up fishing, you know, when he's fishing. And he was on the, the bank tying a spinner onto a, the end of his line. And uh, <clears throat> we heard something just start, just rip off the side of the mountain. And, uh, you know, of course, we thought it was 
several deer and then it got got closer and closer and there was a high wall me and my buddy were in the water and uh we couldn't we couldn't see over the high wall but we we see we turned and looked at my my brother and he was just you know he was standing there in shock his mouth was dropped wide open and uh <clears throat> then his eyes went up he looked up in the air and, and we both turned and looked up in the air just in time to see a big rock you know about the size of a briefcase just hit right in between us and uh and this thing just started i mean it, it was it was screaming like like you couldn't even imagine and um at, at that time we we probably were less than 15 feet away from it and um we we got out of the water quick and went to the other side of the bank and um when we got to the other side of the bank that's that's when when we saw it standing there. and uh it, it it wasn't you know like like the stories you've heard how they're you know eight nine feet tall this 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 dude was about uh you know six and a half feet six over six feet tall but he was just massive he was massive and <laughs> he was pissed let me tell you he, he was mad he grabbed a tree a pretty good sized tree you know it, I, I always say about the size about as big around as a basketball but maybe not quite as big around but it, he just he he tore it to pieces i mean it was whipping back and forth and slapping the ground and and um my brother had actually seen it come off the hill and he said it was running on all fours and then stood up and ran on two legs and back to all four. And it was grabbing, it was like jumping up in the air, grabbing the dirt and just slinging dirt and and, and little tree limbs everywhere. And it never turned its back to us, but, you know, it would turn sideways and it jumped around like you would see, like you would see a chimp do. And um, we were close enough to, we were we were very close, you know. We were close enough to tell. Uh, that's why I keep saying he. It was definitely a fella, and uh, it was flipping its lips at us and and showing us its teeth. It had it had canines. We even we were close enough to see that it had some teeth on the bottom missing. And uh, it, it it scared the. Uh, it, I mean, it scared us to death and. We took off out of there, and my my brother, who was in the middle of tying a spinner on the end of his line, got that dug in his hand, and I guess the bell was open on his fishing pole. But we left everything laying there, and he ran until that lure dug into his hand and snapped the line. And uh, we had a pretty good way to get out of there, but we never looked back. Yeah, I, I don't think I would either. Yeah, in that it, case, I, I, I've never. <laughs> yeah, that, that's I've a scary never story. Been back. Never been back to that spot. I've been, been on the, that that mountain, but but never never back there. And, and you know, I don't know what we did to to, to set it off. I mean, we had been could have been there, and I I've often thought maybe us horse around you know just wrestling around in the water would have i don't know maybe but think, uh, whatever we did i think a lot of times real good i think a lot of times it's just being in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah is that yeah kind of i don't know we that was, we didn't get anything else what was that well, I was just going to ask, because uh, I've heard that before a couple times where they actually run on fours, you know, um, like like a like a monkey, like a chimp. Yeah. And I was just wondering if that's kind of a common behavior if we see that on the East Coast or West Coast or. Yeah, there it is a big difference. Um, and, of course, you know, I've talked a number of times about various types of Sasquatch. Not all things Bigfoot is Bigfoot. Um, you know, we everybody's seen the Patterson film, the creature in that film. So a lot of people think, well, that's Bigfoot. That's one type of, of Bigfoot. Um, what Troy saw is a second type. Uh, there are similarities, but there's a lot of differences also. They're two, actually two different, um, I guess, subspecies. You know, it, it's not really, at least we don't have it categorized yet. People I got the information from apparently do, but, uh, it's not something that the public is privy to, so 
we have two different two different species groupings and then there are two subtypes in each one of those groupings so uh, what we have typically out west is what we see in a Patterson film uh, in the south and the southeast is what Troy saw in the northeast uh, now let me go back up a little bit in the Mississippi River drainage area we have a third type and that one is distinctly different than the other two in that it has a uh, more of a snout like a chimp or a gorilla does um, and then there's the fourth type that's mainly in the Great Lakes area the northeastern part of the country and that's what people describe they, they call it um, you know more of a uh, I guess for the lack of a better term caveman type less hair on the face um, I guess, it, you know, it, it, people have seen my book, The Minnesota Iceman, the pictures there, that's a type four. Um, and there's some other features that distinguish that type from the other three. So, and I was told by my contacts that there's even the possibility of a fifth grouping. Uh, but you know, that's, that's something that's, you know, for down the road for the future for people to, uh, find out about, but they're, uh, those seem to be skinnier, uh, kind of lanky, almost, uh, I don't know, almost they look like they haven't been fed very well. It could be a possibility there's too much inbreeding. We had a couple of people I interviewed who were from Alabama, and there were two different types there. One of the types was the larger type, like what we have here. It could have been a type two, uh, but it was, it was there on the property. They watched it. It was sort of uh, squatted down in some brush and then apparently it sniffed the air and saw two or three of these other types approaching got a real it, it, the witnesses said a disgusted look on its face apparently they caught wind of the the first individual turned around and took off but they were completely different in their appearance so mm. it, it really and, and then of course what we have in the eastern part of the country has a nastier temperament than what we have out here in the west although the ones we have aren't that friendly um, and they can exhibit some real nasty behavior. Uh, the ones in the southeast are definitely uh, a little above them in terms of nastiness and, and temperament. So if if right, you now, know, we're, 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 oh. what's that, Troy? I was just I was just going to say that that. that that drawing that, that that we worked out, that that is that was that's that's pretty exactly what I, and I, I don't know if you if if you, you kind of breaking up there. That's yeah, that drawing. Um, we, we've got a friend that's a very good artist. He started making some drawings of the four different types. He did one of the type one and the type two, like Troy saw. And I'll, uh, when I post this, I'll I'll put the picture on it with that one, so um, you know everybody can see what the type twos look like. Uh, and I have a little more information on the different types, but I, I'm, that's going to be a a book down the road at some point when I get enough information put together about the four different types, you know, and distinguishing them and uh, and what the characteristics are and what they look like and where they are and et cetera. But uh, uh, Brian, you want to uh, want to jump in here? I know you've got lots of questions. Well, I was just going to ask TM, um, has he and his friend talked since this encounter? Or I'm sure they have, but I mean, like, what, what have, uh, has he changed his mind about the possibility? Or does he just chalk it up to, like, a fluke occurrence, a fluke thing that happened? <clears throat> so I asked him about it, and it, it he just, he was adamant. He goes, and he's actually out of country right now. Oh, no. He's going to be back at the end of the month. But he, he's, I think, to satisfy his own, just to make it simple, he said, oh, it's a bird. And, and actually, at the time, um, you know, when we heard the whistle, and he goes, what, what TF? WTF was that? <laughs> um, he was freaked. And then just to kind of, you know, you need to give yourself an answer, you know. Um, so he just said, oh, it's a bird. And at the time, I, I knew instantly, no, not a bird. That is not, you know, if somebody, if I heard somebody whistle loudly and someone else said that was a bird, that's how absurd that was. So, yeah. 
he's uh, if it if it's not in science journals, if it if it if it doesn't have some sort of official recognition, he's it doesn't exist. Is I think his position. I think now, since he worked, oh, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say since he worked in that industry though, in that area, uh, do you think that he'd ever heard any stories and and that's and he just uh, like said, oh well. Since it's not in the scientific journals, I mean, had he heard any stories from anybody that he knew, or was he just skeptical just because um, he had never seen one himself? Or no, that's a good question, um, and I'm gonna I'll ask him because I, I do intend to kind of probe him a little bit more on that on this subject when he gets back. Um, and it's interesting because he actually went <laughs> he went back. Uh, to China and uh, the Himalayas a number of years ago. And supposedly, he said, well, one of the monks showed him a Yeti skull. And he goes, yeah, that wasn't a Yeti skull. That was just a, you know, that was a goat or something. And he laughed it off. So I think I think part of it is that he, you know, like a lot of people, you, you really don't want to take a position that you believe in this mythological creature for fear of you know ridic- ridicule and i think that's where he's coming from it's it's a much safer position to say oh i just don't believe in it i, I really think that's where he's coming from yeah and you know that's a good good time for me to plug my newest book a little bit <laughs> you know one of the big things i always see I, it's probably the most common thing i see written on, on social media and elsewhere is the statement that if the Sasquatch was real, why isn't there any proof? Well, that's nonsense. Uh, I just, in the last week or so, I published my seventh book called Bigfoot Evidence, A Case for the Existence of the Sasquatch. And I've been working with a friend of mine who's a, he's a retired attorney, spent 40 years in courtrooms. Uh, and, and we were talking about this. And, I, you know, I watch... Sometimes, you know, I like to watch police shows, uh, Dateline, things like that, 2020. And, and it's kind of interesting how the legal system works. So between talking with him and watching these shows, I started thinking, well, I wonder how the subject would be presented in that forum, in the legal system. Because everybody currently, and for the past 50, 60 years, It's nothing but personal opinions, whether somebody is a layman or a scientist involved in the subject or, you know, is asked questions about the subject if they're not involved. And it's always their personal opinion, not really based on any structured uh, rules of evidence. So when I talked to my attorney friend, he said, you know, and we brought up the topic of the Patterson Sasquatch. That was that's always the first one people talk about. So we chatted about that a bit. And he said, you know, you have two eyewitnesses and their testimony you have a film and you have trace evidence in the form of footprints he said that would be a slam dunk in a court of law um so i started working on this book and and the book i I did it in the format of john green's original books you know the eight and a half by eleven size so that the pictures there's 130 pictures in there uh i wanted people to have a nice view of photographs because a lot of times they're small in books you don't really good good look and even on the cover i put a picture of uh i don't know if you can can see this uh that color picture right there that's a picture that was sent to me it's a daylight photograph excuse me of a sasquatch in 2009 was taken the people who took the picture want absolutely nothing to do with it Uh uh-oh i think I think we still got everybody here. No, nope, I think we lost Tom. Anyway, uh, uh, no, I see. I see TM, that? but not Troy. Oh wait, oh, I think you're right. Never mind. Tro- Troy's here. I th- yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here. I think I think we lost Tom. Let me try to call him yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, I'm quick. here. Um, so anyway, that book. You know, Will, that's pretty good timing. Yeah, that that one. You that's know, that's pretty it's... good timing with that that book. Uh, Oops. With all that Todd Standing BS, you know, and him him uh, suing the the Canadian government. And... Yeah, I mean, you know, there's just so much nonsense. Um, oh, okay, there he is. 
Let's see. Let me bring... Uh... Okay, there we go. We're going to bring Tom back on. I'll wait a second until he comes back on so we can continue. But yeah, you know, we get all these hoaxers like... Tom, you there? Yeah, I, I am. That was... Uh... That's pilot error. My fault. Oh, no problem. Uh, we got the other fellows. You guys still there? Uh-oh. Let's see. Oh, what happened here? Uh-oh. Well, let's see if I can add the other guys back in. I think I lost them. Uh, let's see. Let's see. All right, what's going on here, Brian? Oh, yeah, Brian's. We'll add Brian back on. <laughs> okay, Tom, you're still there. Oh, uh, hey, Brian. Well, I can see I, I can see you here, but I think we lost the others. Oh Maybe. man, I just. Um. Uh, oops. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, there we are. Uh, okay, Brian, Troy, you guys are both here. Uh oh. Oh yeah. You're there, Troy, right? Brian. Yeah, yes, sir. I'm here. Okay. Brian was just now on here. Man, <laughs> we were talking while you guys were gone. Okay, Brian, you there? Oh man. Uh oh. Okay. Uh, I think we're we're messed up somehow. <laughs> Yeah, I had. Uh, let me see. Jeez, this thing's all messed up. I don't know why I can't add. Let's see if we can add people to this call. Okay, there he is. Oops. Are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, let me see. Why am I not? Oh, there he is. Okay, let me see if we can yeah. get Troy back on. I don't know what happened to the call there, but let's see. I have too many people on my list, I think. There's Troy. Okay. Anyway, uh, Brian, you're there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I, I was just, uh, before we lost you the time, I was talking about the book and uh, that particular image on the cover, and I, inside I, I, I had blown that picture up and I circled, because as the creature's walking away, I've had people say, and I haven't showed it to very many people, one person said, well, it looks like a bear. I said, well, a bear doesn't run with three of its appendages off the ground standing upright. And in, one of, in, in the image, you can see its right foot is clearly stuck, the leg is stretched out and the foot is completely facing the camera. Uh, the foot looks very much like what you see in the Patterson film. The only difference with the Patterson film, that Sasquatch is walking away. In this picture, the creature's running away. Um, and it, and you can tell it's massive. So I wanted to put that in the book, and I do have another photograph in there from a, a Native American gentleman in Alaska that took one. Uh, there were three creatures in his hunting area, and he was kind of upset that they were disturbing his game, and he, and he actually caught one of them on film. So... But there's all kinds of evidence in there, and I talk about this book from it's from the legal standpoint. Um, you know, I we went along with the uh, the federal rules of evidence because the legal system very clearly defines different types of evidence. There's four basic types. Uh, I it defines what evidence is, and everything that we have in the Sasquatch clearly fits into one or more of those categories. So it's based very, very, very loosely on, on a trial setting. I didn't want to go into the book with a trial because that's very cumbersome to go through all the different arguments. And it might have been interesting, but I, I didn't want readers to get bogged down. I simply wanted to show them various types of evidence and, and how it would fit into a court setting. So, you know, I wanted to get away from all this public opinion kind of stuff and, and kind of show a different venue of what is and what isn't evidence and uh it, it's it's kind of an interesting it's an interesting angle to look at the subject from so what is the major objection do you think to um some sort of you know official recognition you know either from academia or or the government um about their existence 
I, I think you'd have to bring one in. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I put a lot of different, I mean, like in this book, you know, oh, there's, I start out with, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the areas of, of evidence. Now there's, I mentioned four types, there are four categories of evidence. Um, now there's the first category is real evidence and real evidence is tangible things. Um, and I suppose it would, things like the tree breaks and, and stuff like that would be real evidence. Of course, scat, um, you know, any, if they're bones, anything like that, uh, demonstrative, which is, you know, putting together a model, like in the Patterson situation, we have this story and it's a very detailed one about what happened during that whole series of events. So that's, that's demonstrating, uh, what was actually the next category of evidence. And, and that's documentary. Now documentary evidence are letters, blog posts, any kind of a document, like an affidavit, things like that. Anything that's that's written or photographs um then there's witness testimony testimonial evidence and that's the one we have thousands thousands and thousands of eyewitnesses um for the past 200 years that have documented what they saw and everybody seems to ignore that they say oh that's not evidence well in a court of law it is so and, and there are two, a couple of cases. One of them was William Rowe in 1955. He actually swore an affidavit about his encounter. That affidavit is, along with his testimony, that's two different types of evidence right there of the four kinds. So, you know, for people to say there's no evidence to support the creature's existence, that's absolute nonsense. In the book, I put in, of course, uh, a number of uh, witness statements. There's, of course, the Patterson film along with uh, Bob Gimlin's interview he did with john green in the early 90s um there's tons of footprints from all over the place i have a bunch of photographs of really good footprints in there uh there's handprints from several locations there's scat there's i mean you know the list goes on and on territorial markings there's all of this stuff so um i wanted people to get a different perspective on the subject with this particular book you know, every, all we get is usually is a bunch of stories. And, and I, I'm producing a couple of books that is just stories because some people like that. But I want people to think from different perspectives on the subject instead of just this one linear path that everybody seems to go down. Yeah, and also I think to further answer Tom's question. What was that, the Brian? The objection is, I think are maybe two things. Oh, I was going to say one of the to further answer Tom's question about its existence are two things, actually. The first would be the fact that it's been, the creature's been popularized in, in books and in movies, and especially the last, we'll say 50, 60 years. And it's kind of, you know, viewed as kind of like a, like a Frankenstein type of monster or like vampires, you know, mm -hmm. that, that people think. So that's one thing. But the other thing too, is that, and we've talked about this before, in a previous podcast, but you have a lot of hoaxers out there that really kind of damage the, you know, the real opinions of perhaps real encounters that people might have. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people on the fence. I think the majority of people on the fence, you have, you have kind of three groups. You have two small groups. Now, one is one of those small groups are the people who are, are totally into it. And, and unfortunately, there's a lot of them that will believe pretty much anything they see and hear out there. Um, there's the other group who want nothing to do with it. They're the debunkers. Then they'll prove it's wrong regardless of the evidence. Then there's the big majority. And that's people who are kind of on the fence. Uh, and, it's, and we have some of those people who are, who are interested in the subject. They've had things. They've seen things or heard things. Uh, but they're leaving an open mind. And, and there's kind of a range in there. Some people are, are very skeptical, but, you know, they're open to being shown proof. And what happens with these hoaxers and this nonsense that goes on is, is it really damages that large group of people that have the, have the true open minds. Exactly, exactly. Any, any thoughts there, fellas? Well, I was just curious. Um, 
because I've read and I seem to remember back in um, you know Oregon and Washington. Um, you know, it seemed like there was a time back in the '70s when it was actually it was it was taken seriously. It was a serious subject, then it just sort of became a thing of, um, you know, like almost a, a sort of a tabloid subject. But prior to that, I think there was some real interest um, with the media, even where they they actually took it seriously. And now it's almost like, you know, it's like taboo. You just you, you don't touch it because you know there's the ridicule factor. Well, you know what happened in the beginning, and and it kind of goes back to the Bluff Creek area. That was, I mean, it, and this was going in other places. It wasn't just there, but it was that place was kind of given the main attention. Uh, when when the road building crews like the, the op, uh, dozer operator Jerry Crew would go, would go out to his equipment and he'd find these footprints around the dozer, he was able to actually take uh, a local newspaper reporter out there with him, and they together found footprints. So it was wasn't just some guy telling a story. He was able to bring this person out and show them what was going on. So. Then you get people like John Green and Renee DeHinden and, and Bob Titmus, those folks. Uh, and, and they were all very serious people. When you, when you talk about people who are, uh, you know, true pioneers in something, I, I think we envision people like, you know, the founders of our country and, and so forth that were of a, a different type of breed of people than, than the average person. And having known those men, I, I can say that they actually were of that breed of person. So they, they kind of stood above uh, the average person going out looking into the subject with the way that they looked and, at everything and approached the subject. Uh, they were very meticulous about, you know, uh, all the details of what were being found, uh, the stories of the people behind them. They looked into the people behind these stories and uh, and spent a lot of time really uh, documenting that stuff and, and looking at it from all angles. So, you know, they, they were pretty harsh when it came to, you know, judging whether something was real or fake uh, because they knew the seriousness of it, that if it, and there was enough to judge that it was real. So they took that line. Then the people started coming in after them as the subject got notoriety. Uh, there were some real crackpots who started entering the subject and it got to be just like it is today. Uh, where the majority of them are after some sort of recognition and or financial gain from the subject. And, and we see that all the time. And especially, you know, what's on television and, and elsewhere, uh, it's presented very poorly, I, I think, in the public. So a lot of people don't, you know, they don't want anything to do with it because they think it's all crap. Absolutely. Well, I was going to ask Tom, um, had you ever had any other accountants? Had, um, what was the uh, question again? I said, had you had, had any other encounters or had heard of any other from people that you knew, that you know? No, I hadn't. Uh, I mean, not in my, not anybody that I know personally. And um, I wish I did, but no, this was, uh, and I actually, you know, this happened in, in for me, it happened in mid-December, and I thought about it. It was it. It was after Christmas, actually, when I wrote Will, because it kind of it just it just stayed with me, and it stayed with me, and it bothered me. And, and the more I thought about it, it was just so I wanted somebody to come in with some expertise and really give give it kind of a critical analysis. <clears throat> you know, did I see this, or or I mean, not did I see it, but was was what I heard a Sasquatch or was it something else? Because I had really thought about it and I just eliminated every other possibility that I could think of. And I wanted somebody to come in and just sort of, uh, you know, almost like grill me or grill the uh, experience. Well, and I think, again, like I mentioned, there were, you had two different things that really kind of stuck out that happened. You had the, the snap tree that was unlike weather breaks. And, and this was Northern Oregon, correct? Uh, no, no, this was more, uh, this will be mid to the South end of Oregon. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll tell you something now that sort of, 
makes me think with a different perspective too because I, I've been doing some work with people in kind of that region. I, I don't want to say because I don't want people running all over the place out yeah. there. Uh, there's another person, an elk hunter, and her husband that I interviewed her recently, and uh, it, it's a very interesting situation. She sent me, she had pictures of a, a lot of footprints, uh, both in dirt and snow. Uh, her, her and her husband and her father, who's disabled, were out elk hunting, um, and I believe this was about a year ago. I could be wrong in that, but uh, she sent me three pictures of this elk, and I investigated one of these situations myself back in 1980. Uh, where mushroom pickers found a couple of elk carcasses that had been torn apart. And and uh, fish and game officials got involved and uh, actually grilled a friend of mine without... Uh, he, let, he didn't let them know anything that he knew about this particular subject, but uh, as soon as they left, and he actually saw the written report, and they th- after they threatened him to keep silent about it, um, that the elk, it said in the report, the elk were dismembered without the use of tools. And then it wasn't any other animal that did it, so, or people. Uh, so I investigated, found a lot of Sasquatch tracks, sent them to John Green, all this stuff that happened back then. So when I talked to this lady, she actually had a sighting very close up with one of these creatures. Uh, and, I, and I think it's in your area that you're talking about. Or at least pretty close, which is a very active area on the coast. Very active. Um, It's probably one of the one of the better hot spots anywhere on the on the west coast. So I looked at these pictures of this elk, uh, and and they're pretty disturbing because the head's been ripped. Well, let me let me finish the, the the account about the story because the story itself makes a huge difference in what what's in the pictures. And, and Tom, I'll, I'll send you the pictures so you can see them, and, and you guys also. Uh, her father, I mentioned, is disabled, so he doesn't get around too well. Now, they weren't next to roads. They're in a place where there's a very, very small population. So they were way out in the middle of nowhere hunting elk. Uh, her father shot this elk. It ran off. He followed it as far as he could cross-country, then had to sit down. And then pretty soon his daughter and son-in-law come along, and they finished tracking the elk to make sure it was dead. Uh, not suffering and, and to try to harvest it so within about 30 minutes after he shot the elk and it took off they they found it they followed the blood trail found it the elk is clearly torn to pieces the head was torn off all four of the legs were torn off at the uh, at the knee uh, the skin was peeled off the body hind hind quarters and front quarters were gone the only thing that was really left was the spine and its uh, the the sac with its intestines, internal organs, and they said the blood was still fresh and everything. I mean, this all this elk was dismembered in less than thirty minutes, and there were there were no footprints of people. There were Sasquatch tracks associated with it. Uh, it was pretty disturbing, the account. So, you know, when when you talk about, you know, I, I look at the larger picture. And I know of other things that have gone on in that region also. There's, Like I said, it's, it's a hotbed of activity. And it's not a place where a lot of people just want to go wandering into because of the, uh, uh, the way these creatures behave in that particular region. Uh, it's not, not a good situation for the most part. But um, with the whistle, which is something we do know that they do predominantly uh, in terms of vocals, and in the snap tree so you have this history of what's going on in the area currently and in the past what you heard and what you saw it tend it, it lends to um uh, lead me to think that it was a sasquatch that you encountered yeah and i do want to go back um and I, i've been <laughs> the buddy of mine who's out of country right now he would go back i know he will when he gets when he gets back but i have another friend of mine who won't go there because he believes in Sasquatch. I'm like, dude, come on, man. We're going to go there in the daytime. Nothing's going to happen. We're not, I'll pay you 50 bucks if we see something. But um, did you say that you are going to send pictures of that uh, scene that you just described? Yeah. Okay, because I've – all right, so here's the thing. i got a friend of mine yeah. who um, 
she's done work on federal wildlife. She has a clinic here in town. She's a veterinarian. Um, and so with your permission, would, would you be okay with me just showing those to her and kind of getting her opinion? Yeah. Now, on part of it, now one of the first things I saw is is there is part of the animal that does look like it was may have been cut. But I, I talked to a forensic anthropologist friend of mine, and I sent him the pictures. And one of the things that he's been asking me for the past few years about um, are Sasquatches using rudimentary tools, stone tools. And I never saw anything, never really thought about it, but he, he did make a good point in saying that, that all primates do make and use tools. Um, and in this particular case, I, when I showed him the pictures, he says, yeah, he says, uh, it does in one part look like, uh, and a stone tool can be as sharp as a knife or sharper in cases. So could it have been cut with a, a stone tool? Absolutely. Um, and again, you have to look at the context of a situation. I mean, the animal did, wasn't gone long enough for people. And I've seen lots of uh, poaching, you know, especially up around Mount Rainier where I, I grew up and hunted up in that area. I saw lots of poaching up there. Uh, this is nothing like I ever saw. And to, for it to be done with in less than 30 minutes, uh, it would be virtually impossible. You know, it takes quite a bit of time to, to quarter out an elk and, and to you know, get it ready to go, and there's no animal certainly going to do that. And he made a good point with the the, the, the gut sack. Uh, if it was, you know, a cougar or something like that, a bear or whatever, uh, just for, you know, the sake of argument, that would have been the first part that would have been torn open and eaten. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been left there like that intact. So um, it, it's interesting. I mean, some of the things we see, and, and we know that they do other things with deer, so um, it's just the, the time element and the circumstances, the story, you know, and, and the fact there were no other people up there. So they would have seen the footprints in the snow if there was anybody up there. Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I've dressed out deer before, you know, deer hunting and uh, <clears throat> blacktail. And you're not going to do a blacktail in a half hour unless you're really fast or faster than I am. Mm -hmm. But did did you say this was in the on the Oregon coast or um, maybe in the Cascades? Yeah. Uh, and if you don't want to say it, that's fine. I don't want it's, to. You know, that's it's it's I'm actually it, it would be. Uh, I mean, of course, that's a big area. It's sort of sort of east of Crater Lake. Oh, oh okay. Kind, All right. kind of in that general part of Oregon. I, I don't want to specifically say. Yeah, but, um, gotcha. Right. But I, I've looked at the area in Google Earth and and um, and know something of the history of the area in regards to these things and. Um, it's a, a lot of spooky stuff happens in that region. So maybe it is a good idea to not, I, I was tempted the other day to just say, I heck, I'm just going to get my truck and drive up there alone, but no. I, you know, <laughs> I really, I always recommend against going alone because with these things, it's always a numbers game. If they think there are more, more people than them, uh, they'll be standoffish. If they think there are more of them than they are you, then you then it's going to be a different situation. That's why you know I, uh, I have a, I, I, I have a friend in uh, Southern Washington in, in Washougal who's uh, uh, an ex cop and he got himself in a situation a year ago where him and a couple of buddies were in elk hunting and uh, two the other two guys ended up moving their positions without him knowing where they went and they they went off some distance and. He used his elk call and, and apparently drew five of these things. Uh, they surrounded him in, in a matter of a mi couple of minutes. And the only way he got himself out of the situation was by doing a couple of things I told him to do. And that's if you're in a situation like that, start talking out loud like you're talking to other people that are nearby. And that for some reason that throws him off. And he was able to get to his truck. But had he not done that, um, you know, who knows? And there was another guy who vanished in that same area at the same time. Wow. So there, there are things, you have to be very careful with these things because they, uh, they're kind of nasty critters. You got that right. Yeah, like guy from... Troy knows. Yeah. <laughs> was that Troy? Uh, was that you? That yeah, I was. Virginia? 
Yeah, Troy, Troy was that, in West Virginia. That was a scary story. You actually saw it, and and it's kind of freaky that it's oh, running. Yes, sir, I was in West Fours. Man. Yeah, I, I mean, we were, we were. I mean, when when we when I say a little mountain stream, it was, you know, it was, it was less than ten, ten. We didn't want to go close enough to see its teeth. We were close enough to see genitals, everything. So, uh, and, and <laughs> I wouldn't advise anybody going out looking for these things by themselves. That's that's just a bad idea. But that's just my opinion. Well, I thought it was a good opinion. You know, was, and, and that's a situation if you go on you go on YouTube or something, you look at uh, videos of, of chimps, you know, raising hell uh, in territorial displays or gorillas, and then imagine something that's, you know, 800 pounds doing that, you know, 10 or 15 feet away from you, uh, you know, with, with teeth and, and just raising holy hell and, and vocaling and the whole works. I mean, that's a pretty frightening situation to be in. Will, one thing I forgot to mention. Right, and you, also, hear, you hear people talk about. Oh, hold on. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, Go ahead. Uh, I just going to say one thing I did forget to mention about my encounter was when we went up there, um, there was a just a, you know, before you even get to the mountain, but kind of on the on the periphery of the wilderness there, there is a big open field is actually a like a pasture. And there was probably 50 or 60 elk laying down in this pasture. And we both commented on that. That's really, really strange. They're usually off in the wilderness. Why are they down here? So, um, you know, maybe, and I'm just speculating here, but maybe they felt a little safer. They knew what was up there at that time and just decided, hey, you know what? We're going to just sit out in this pasture for now. Because when I went back there, uh, about four weeks later, and I couldn't make it to the top because the snow had really come in. But uh, the elk were not there. They weren't in the pasture. They were gone. So just that one time we went up there, there was like, a, you know, I would say probably combined, you know, maybe two herds were there. And, and it's speculation, but, you know, my thinking is that, uh, and obviously you heard you heard a whistle. If that was a Sasquatch, there were more than one, probably a group of them in that area. And it's very possible they were hunting the herd. Oh, wow, I hadn't thought of that, yeah. And depending on how close you were to them, you know, that may have been a signal warning others that of your presence. Yeah, the whistle was probably 20 or 30 yards from me. And from our location to where the elk were would have been a few miles, maybe three, four miles yeah, that's that's relatively close in terms of Sasquatches. So, yeah, it's entirely possible. And again, it's speculation, but in the absence of other uh, possibilities, it's a it's an interesting thought. Yeah, I just thought it was a piece of circumstantial evidence um, for the whole the whole you know scenario. Well, listen, fellows, we're running out of time on the recording, so uh, we'll go around on any last thoughts. Uh, Tom, you wanna? Jump in there. Any last thoughts before we wrap yeah. up? Or? Yeah, I just want, I really, more than anything else, I just want to thank you for listening to my story and, uh, you know, confirming that there's some stuff going on here in Oregon. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, how about you? Uh, no, I, I don't have it. I did have one question, but I, but Tom just answered it. <laughs> I was okay. If he had gone there again or if he planned to go there again. And, um, but, um, but yeah, we'll have to do, do this podcast again sometimes will absolutely absolutely uh troy how about you any final thoughts oh troy's quiet well all right fellas uh, uh, yeah just oh there you go and uh with tom the uh, yeah yeah i'm here now i'm just gonna reiterate don't go by your... yeah definitely don't go by yourself I won't. I won't. If you guys don't hear from me again, you know, I did. And, awesome. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and don't go out there at night because uh, in the daytime, they're typically in different locations. Uh, at nighttime, they're down low. Oh. They're, they're hunting. So anywhere, anywhere the deer are uh, is pretty much where you don't want to be during those different times of, of the clock. So, 
All right, fellas. Well, listen, we're going to wrap up. Thanks for this uh, get-together. We'll have to do this again here soon. Thanks again. Sounds good. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.